So most of you, I think, know that I'm an OBGYN, and I think most of you know that I am also getting a PhD in medical anthropology. And some of you may think, what in God's name do those things have to do with each other? What you may not know is that um, I practice both at a county hospital and also at a jail where I take care of incarcerated women. And as I hope you'll appreciate by the end of my talk, the complexities of providing medical care, particularly reproductive health care, for women who are in the grips of our carceral system um, is incredibly nuanced and um, uh, very troubling in many ways, but also very inspiring. Um, and so my PhD studies are attentive to all of those nuances and complexities. Some people often ask me, how did you get interested or how did you come to work with incarcerated women? And the short version of the story is when I was in the middle of my first year of residency, it was the middle of the night, I was delivering a baby as I had done many, many times before. And everything was very familiar about the delivery scene, the nervousness, the wondering if everything was gonna be okay, instructing the woman to push or helping her uh, uh, to guide her to push. But the one thing that was different is that she was shackled to the bed. She was a prisoner at a nearby prison. And that moment troubled me so deeply that I developed an interest in learning more about these women. So as you're mulling some of these things over, I wanna ha have you all think about a few questions that you may never have thought about before. What do you think uh, is the percentage of women in prison who have children less than 18 years old? 14%, 38%, 62%, or 81%? How many states have laws? I'll tell you by the end. How many states have laws which prohibit the shackling of pregnant women in labor? Zero, 15, 26, or 50. True or false, incarcerated women do not have a legal right to an abortion. So it's impossible to talk about health care for incarcerated women without talking about incarceration in general. And in the United States, our carceral system is notorious for many things, but I think they can be distilled down to four, um, four fundamental points. One is that our system uh, is characterized by its mass proportions. On any given day, there are 2.3 million adults behind bars. In 1980, there were 500,000 adults behind bars. So there's been an exponential rise. It's also characterized by high cost, and we spend more than $49 billion per year on our correctional system. This number, 49 billion, is just for state prisons and doesn't include local, ja local jails or federal, federal prisons. Our system is characterized by high recidivism. 50% of people who are released from prison return within three years of their release. And it is also characterized by tremendous racial disparities um, and that it incarcerates mostly people of color. On any given day, one in every 104 adults is behind bars. One in every nine black men is behind bars. Now, what about women in all of this? Well, women actually make up a much smaller proportion of the um, correctional population than men, not surprisingly. They're about 9%. 9% uh, of everyone who's incarcerated are women. Um, but the war on drugs, which escalated with um, Reagan and everyone following him, um, has really had the most disproportionate impact on women. And um, since then, we've seen an exponential rise in the number of women who are behind bars. And most women are incarcerated for nonviolent non crimes, mostly related to drugs. 62% of women who are behind bars are mothers to children less than 18 years old. So when, you, when incarcerated women come into prison or jail, um, that is a tremendous disruption to family and community strength. So because women comprise such a small proportion of the incarcerated population, their gender-specific needs have been neglected. And for me, that is particularly salient when it comes to their health care. So what about health care and prisoners? Many of you may be surprised to hear that prisoners are the only people in our country with a constitutionally guaranteed right to health care. And that comes from a case in 1976, which I won't go into the details of. But the ultimate um, outcome of the, of the case was that Justice Marshall um, declared that the deliberate indifference to the serious medical needs of prisoners constitutes the unnecessary and wanton infliction of pain prescribed by the Eighth Amendment. And based on this, prisoners have a constitutional right to health care. How that plays out on the ground, especially for women and their reproductive health care, though, is highly variable. 
So abortion and prisoners. Um, it's something that uh, troubles people a lot when they think about it, um, and it brings up a lot of complicated issues as abortion politics in general does. But when you're talking about women who have very little choice in general with when they shower, when they can eat, when they can visit and make a phone call with their family members, when you talk, try to talk about choice and the freedom to choose your reproductive destiny, there is um, absolutely nothing that is free about, um, about reproductive health in prison. And in theory, women do have a choice to have an abortion if they, if they learn they're pregnant when they're in prison. There are um, constitutional guarantees, the Eighth and the Fourteenth Amendment, and there are a number of judicial, judicial precedents, lots of class action lawsuits that say imposing um, requirements for court orders to, to be transported off site for an abortion, that constitutes an un undue burden and that restricting a woman's access to an abortion just because she's inca incarcerated doesn't ser serve any punitive interest. So it's very clear that incarcerated women should have access to abortion. However, in practice, you may wonder, what does a coffee cup, R-rated movie, and cigarettes have to do with abortion? Well, Sheriff Arpaio from Arizona says that when you're in jail, you lose a lot, a lot of rights, whether it's trying to get an abortion or watching an R-rated movie or smoking or drinking coffee. So on the ground, the people who are making the decisions have incredible discretion, and many women lack access to abortion if they, if they choose this. Many women learn they're pregnant when they first get to jail or prison, and many women choose to continue those pregnancies, or if they are not able to have an abortion, they're forced into continuing a pregnancy. About 1,400 to 2,000 births occur every year to women who are behind bars. What they get for prenatal care is highly variable, although, um, although there are standards that exist that require prisons and jails to have prenatal care on site, um, what happens on the ground is incredibly variable. And some women have to be transported off site to get prenatal care. Some women don't even get prenatal care when they're in prison or jail. What happens when they're in labor? Well, they get usually transported to an outside hospital. They can't have any family support members in the room with them because they're incarcerated. Um, and so they're at the whim of the, the jail guards and the, the providers, the medical providers taking care of them. So they have a baby, and then what happens to the child? Well, it depends where they are. If they're in, j in jail, which is county, um, at county level, they have to be separated from their baby once they go back, once they leave the hospital and go back to jail. And the baby will either go into custody of the state, or if the person has designated a family member to take care of that baby, then, um, then they'll have a, a more contact with the baby until they get out and can reclaim custody. Some prisons do have nursery programs where mothers can be with their babies, um, sometimes for a few weeks, and in some states up to 18 months. Um, however, you also have to think about the irony and the tragedy of a child starting its life out in prison. Mm. This is one of the most disturbing pictures, um, but it's, it's an image that um, is incredibly disturbing, and this is what inspired me to work with this population. This is an image of a woman in labor, shackled. Um, and there are many reasons why this is um, dangerous. It's obviously inhumane and a, and a clear human rights violation and unnecessary. Many of you in this room are mothers and have given birth, and the idea of running away <laughs> while you're in labor <laughs> probably seems um, very, very difficult. Um, but on, <laughs> on top of all of those obvious reasons why it's inhumane and uh, unnecessary to shackle a woman in labor, it actually poses a lot of medical risks both to the mother and to the fetus and interferes with our ability as obstetricians to, um, to take care of, of, of our patients. Um, and to do in emergent interventions if necessary. There are only 15 states which have laws restricting the shackling of women in labor and delivery. 15 states. The yellow states are, are ones which are considering laws right now, um, but, uh, but for now there are only 15 states. California passed a law in 2005 outlawing shackling, um, but it was only during labor and delivery. And there have been bills the last two years um, which have proposed outlawing at other points in pregnancy. They have been vetoed by both governors, and I'm hoping that the third time is the charm this year. And um, this is just an image of the San Francisco jail where I, where I work and also of a state prison. Um, and this is just to um, remind you, you've all probably driven by the San Francisco jail, perhaps not known that it was a jail. 
Um, people think prisons and jails are far away and the people who get locked up inside, we can forget about them, they have nothing to do with us, but in fact they have everything to do with us on our everyday, everyday existence. Resources that have been funneled away from education and social services, services for the elderly, have been funneled into pr building more prisons and building more jails. Um, and have also been direct, uh, diverted away from medical care, which many of these people who are incarcerated, the only place they get medical care is when they become incarcerated and become prisoners. And so um, I hope that I've given you some things to think about, about the complexities of what it's like to be a woman who needs reproductive health care um, when you're in the grips of the prison or jail system. Thank you.